get started. So, welcome everyone to the 2019 Yellow Springs Home Inc. Annual Meeting. I'm Chris Bongiorno, I'm the board president, and I uh, really appreciate everybody joining us on this beautiful May afternoon. I'm sure you didn't have anything better to be doing, but we're very glad to have you here. I also want to take a moment to thank Antioch College. Is anyone here from the college? Other than, well, yes, we have several of you. Um, I thought I saw President Manley in the room earlier, but uh, anyways, thank you so much for enabling us to use this beautiful space. We're usually in the Coretta Scott King Center, which is also on the campus, um, but we, we, we're excited to have a, a change of scenery this year in this great space. So thank you to Antioch College for hosting us. So how many Home Inc. members do we have in attendance today? Raise your hand if you're a member. That's great. So uh, about half of us are either board members or members of the organization. So you're familiar with our mission. For those of you who are not, uh, the mission of Home Inc. is to strengthen community and diversity in Yellow Springs and Miami Township by providing permanent and uh, sustainable uh, housing through our community land trust. And I'm going to let Emily, later in our program, talk to you about how we've done that in the past year. But I'll just say quickly that we've done uh, an amazing amount of work with community support from folks like you and from uh, others in the community to achieve not only our mission and vision over the last 12 months, but also to uh, really put a bow on our three-year strategic plan, which was from 2016 to 18, and kickstart our next strategic planning effort, which will take us into the next five years. So again, we'll hear a lot more about that from Emily later. I'm excited to see that too, because it's always a great presentation. Um, our annual meeting is also an opportunity to um, cover some board business. Uh, we'll send off some long-term board members and we will welcome new members in, uh, as well as renew some members who have new terms to get started. And it's also an opportunity every year for us to bring in a special speaker. And this year's speaker comes to us from Washington, D.C., but also from Antioch College. Uh, Larry, will, Larry Pearl will be our guest speaker today. He is a National Fair Housing Expert and an Antioch College alum. And with that, I thank you all again for coming. A uh, quick point of order. If you do need restrooms, uh, they are on the second floor. There's an elevator for those of you who may need the elevator. So restrooms on the second floor, and we'll have refreshments at the end. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to our board treasurer, Kevin Magruder, to introduce Mr. Pearl. Thanks, Chris. And uh, so in addition to being board treasurer, I'm wearing two hats also as a history professor here at Antioch. And this program really came about uh, through both of those um, affiliations. Um, my, one of my research areas is real estate, urban history, housing history. Um, and then from my involvement with Yellow Springs Home Inc. and the Housing Advisory Board over the last couple of years, you may have seen discussions about affordable housing in the news. And as Emily and I talked about that, particularly uh, some of the comments that were directed at Yellow Springs Home Inc., we felt it was a, a teachable moment to really provide an opportunity for people to understand that we do have a fair housing law, and we've had it for 51 years now, and uh, that's what Larry's going to talk about today. Larry Pearl has degrees from Antioch College, he's class of 1955, and Yale Law School, and also studied sociology at the Harvard Graduate School of Social Relations. He began his federal career as an attorney advisor in the general counsel office of housing and home finance agency. He retired from uh, 37 years later as the acting deputy assistant secretary for program operations and compliance in the office of fair housing and equal opportunity. Larry Curl. Second World War to 1968. You can't ignore 
however, the earlier uh, events. And I'm going to refer to those uh, perhaps a little quickly, but they're very important. One of the things we start with, the typical American family today has 10 times, the white family today has 10 times as much wealth as a typical African American family, 10 times. It's an amazing statistic. Some of it is due to differences in income, uh, jobs, uh, still discrimination in employment, and all that. But the wealth comes from investments, if you have money to invest, and housing. That's just it. And so uh, the reason for that disparity goes way back. And the past is indeed prologue. One of the first things to demonstrate that at the time of the Civil War, there was a Freedmen's Bureau that was set up. It was run by General, former General Oliver Howard, the white Civil War general uh, for the North. And he had people all over the South, he had agents ready to administer this program. They were trying to get the ex-slaves to the point where they could get better educations, could get a fair shake in court, that kind of thing. But he was also interested in land, and he had a plan to give ex-slaves 40 acres, no mules, 40 acres. They had about 100,000 acres to work with. That would have been a lot of people getting land. Terrific. One problem, Lincoln was assassinated. President Johnson was not with the program. In fact, President Johnson said, unless the court has transferred that land by judicial decree. It belongs to the former slave master, regardless of whether it was confiscated or abandoned. That was the end of the 40 acres. So that if the people, the ex-slaves, wanted to stay on the land, they had to negotiate with the former slave owner. Union troops threw hundreds, probably in the low thousands, of ex-slaves off by it because they couldn't or wouldn't negotiate with the landowners. Some of them stayed on, became sharecroppers. Sharecropper is kind of a marginal way to live, and it was not a way to own land, except for very few people. The statistics today in terms of farming, 95% of farmers are white. 1.3% are African American. How different would that have been with 40 years? <coughs> After the Civil War, there were many states in the South adopted black codes. These were also intended to try to keep the ex-slaves down, down on the land, which they couldn't own. Uh, and of course, that went along with the, with the founding and the growth of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, it was a pretty bad time. And again, there were things like Ex-slaves may not fish or hunt, because if they could fish or hunt, they might be independent. We wanted to work to the former owners. That was the idea. Then, in the late 19, 1890s, came Plessy versus Ferguson, where the Supreme Court came down on second duty, and true, it was in connection with railway cars, but it had a very far-reaching effect. Right after that came racial zoning. Oh, great. We can zone this area over here for whites and this area over here for blacks and never the same <coughs> for me. Well, the Supreme Court took care of that around 1917. And what, what was the reaction by the National Association of Real Estate Brokers? They worked out a deal that if a white broker sold to a black in a white area, the state issued license of that broker was gone. The state issued license, not the, not the brokers working. So government is involved in this intimately from, from the get-go. There was another reaction to uh, the overthrow of racial zoning, and that's neighborhood improvement associations. Uh, the neighborhood people got together, and they still have kind of associations today, hopefully not quite in the same vein that we had them back then. Some of the things they did, they lobbied city councils for zoning restrictions. 
threatened boycotts real estate, of real estate agents who sold homes to blacks, withdrew patronage from white merchants who catered to black clients, collected money to buy out black purchasers, purchase vacant property, or offer cash bonuses to black renters to move, and they implemented restrictive covenants. Oh, right, covenants. They really started around 1890, but once the Supreme Court knocked out the idea that you could racially zone, they really took, they really took hold. And the restrictive covenants simply said, they were in your deed, said, if you sell to a restricted group, and it wasn't always just African Americans, in the West it included Asians, it could include Jews, sort of who, whoever that group was that you didn't want coming in, if you sold to such a person, then a whole group, like maybe the neighborhood of the Improvement Association, would be entitled to sue you and get a whole lot of money. So it certainly was a deterrent, to put it mildly. It was a way of, of continuing segregation. And those restrictive covenants lasted until the Supreme Court said you couldn't enforce them in the 40s, and we'll get to that later. After the First World War, and I shouldn't say during, but really after the First World War, when part of this was when African Americans who had been fought in the war came back, but post-war, the same thing happened after the Second World War, but after the First World War, there was a lot of unrest, same, in the same way there was later. African Americans came back, they had fought for the country, and they expected to get some civil rights which they had not had previously. And that led to race riots. Chicago had an extremely bad race riot in 1919 and left 38 people dead. Uh, about a thousand people, black people, thrown out of their homes. Very ugly time. And after the Depression moving ahead, the federal government started to get into housing. Uh, a little uneven. The Federal Housing Administration insured mortgages that lenders, banks, other lenders made. And they were um, not really into doing, to, uh, of the, insuring the loans that were made to black customers. Um, or, for that matter, to whites with black neighbors. If you lived in a block and you were white, and one black moved into that whole block, think how many houses that would be, FHA, FHA Federal Housing Administration, would not insure mortgages for anyone else in the entire block. Public housing, which started in the early 30s, that was segregated. No surprise there. And then there was one other little tool, and that was called buying on contract. You couldn't get a mortgage, but you wanted to get a house, and you didn't want to just rent. You could buy a house on contract. This was very popular in Chicago, especially. And so what that meant was, I have a house. You're, uh, you can't get a mortgage, and so I'll give you a contract. And what that means is you pay me every month, like a mortgage, but there's just one catch. You miss one payment, you're gone. You get no equity. At least with a mortgage, you would have some if you would pay for 10 years, uh, 20 or whatever it might be. You'd have some, you'd have some equity. With contract buyers, you were stuck. And so it was especially important to get, uh, to find a means that you would avoid um, having that eventuality come to pass. So how do you do that? Well, maybe you've got some extra space, so you rent out the basement, or you rent out an extra bedroom. Um, you make sure to get a little extra income so you don't run that situation where some months you just won't have enough money. And what does that, what does that cost? What causes an overcrowding? And what, what happens with overcrowding? The housing deteriorates. Uh, you don't have the money to fix it up, and the landlord's not particularly interested in fixing it up, and there's not really a code enforcement. And so what happens is the housing gets run down, and then people say, see what happens when those people move in? So you have the vicious circle going with contract buying. Uh, the, government, the government's position was in all this, we're not, we're not really segregating. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't what we're doing. It's, uh, it's the market. Uh, the market says that black occupancy is undesirable. So we're, we're just following the market. 
That was the federal government's statements up until the early 40s and, and later, really. The government also studied about uh, the, the quality of neighborhoods. Uh, you've all heard of red line. And red line <coughs> meant literally drawing a red line about, around the neighborhood. Uh, there was a study done, and the people who were studying would look at a city and they'd say, oh, this, this area over here, this is, this is solid over here. These areas here, maybe not so much. And this area over here, hmm, we're going to draw that in red as opposed to the green area. And hmm, what can you draw that red line? It's usually around the minority area. Surprise. A couple of years ago, I went to a housing conference. And this was, uh, they were talking about um, Sacramento, California. And in Sacramento, uh, the person who uh, was presenting this showed where the red line was in Sacramento. And then he showed where the foreclosures were in 2008. Yeah. And you looked at those two maps, and you could really not tell them apart. Why? I mean, that, that's how the past pushes forward. So as we go into the 40s, we have the situation of the competition for jobs and housing, particularly from the returning veterans. 1943, 242 race riots in 48 cities. It was a pretty rough time back then. And uh, the violence against returning veterans included uh, the murder of two families in the South, uh, burning out a veteran in California, uh, riots in Chicago when one black family moved into a suburban housing, uh, public housing. And there was much more than that. One of the particular examples, which I just read about, um, and which I certainly didn't remember or know about, um, a, a soldier, an African-American soldier named Isaac Woodard, he was riding a bus, he had just been uh, discharged, and he was still wearing his uniform. He was on a bus going through Georgia, and when he got to Batesburg, he got into a little dispute with the bus driver, the white bus driver, who put him off the bus. Batesburg, this little town, had a police chief and an assistant. The police chief beat Woodard to the point where he blinded him in both eyes. He was sent to a hospital in Aiken, South Carolina, nearby. He never recovered his sight. There's a book about this. Uh, there's a book list here, and this book is not on that list, but it's, it's uh, worth reading if you have the time and interest. It's called Unexampled Courage. And it's about the judge in Charleston, South Carolina, who later sat on the trial of the sheriff who had beaten Isaac Woodard, uh, who, as you might expect, uh, the sheriff was acquitted in 30 minutes by an all-white jury. But that kind of got to Judge Woodard, uh, Judge Waring, excuse me, and Judge Waring later sat on one of the cases that became Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, it's a, it is a fascinating story. It's written by a lawyer. In fact, it's written by a district judge who is in the same courtroom now in South Carolina that Judge Waring said it. it is a fascinating story. But it reached other people. President Truman heard about it, as he heard about the other problems that returning veterans had. And in 1948, which was an election year, he, uh, he advanced the recommendations of a Committee on Civil Rights that he appointed in 1947. The Committee on Civil Rights came in with a lot of recommendations. And what President Truman did was he ordered the desegregation of the federal workforce and the desegregation of the armed forces. Anybody see the soldier's story uh, on Saturday here? That was a very different army in 1944 than, uh, not that it changed overnight in 1948 by any means. The army, in fact, was really dragged its feet about carrying out Truman's order. But uh, the, uh, <coughs> the movement forward in civil rights generally. Did that affect housing? No, it didn't. But a lot of these things, as I get to talking about the 40s and 50s, you see things coming together that sort of push civil rights forward. And eventually, housing catches up. Housing is usually the last 
thing to catch up after a moment and some other things, which is exactly what happened. Another thing that happened, a um, very important thing, in 1944, Congress passed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, which was also called the GI Bill, a very well-known uh, bill, covered education and home loans for returning veterans. And there were some problems with that, and Southern colleges would not admit black uh, applicants. The VA encouraged blacks to pursue menial, uh, menial occupations. And a survey of 13 Mississippi, state, 13 Mississippi cities found that African Americans received only two, that's two, of the 3,200 home business and farm loans administered by the Veterans Administration in 1947. Two out of 3,200. Uh, not a very good deal. <coughs> In the meantime, other things were happening. Jackie Robinson wrote the color line of Major League Baseball in 1947. He was well known. He was a hero. Could he get housing? No, not in New York. He eventually ended in Connecticut. And for a while, he stayed with the family of Carly Simon. Carly Simon, I learned recently, thought that she might become the first female professional baseball player. Well, that didn't happen. She had a career, a pretty good career otherwise. Uh, Willie Mays, about 10 years later, Willie Mays, say hey, say hey guy. Trouble finding housing in San Francisco with Willie Mays? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. He needed the help of Mayor Christopher to find a house in San Francisco. Around this time, organizations started to percolate. In 1947, the National Association of Human Rights Workers was organized to advance the science of intergroup relations, facilitate the exchange of ideas and information among individuals and organizations devoted to coordinating, combating racial, ethnic, religious, gender, and other forms of discrimination. And two years later, the International Association of Official Human Rights Agencies was formed for generally the same purpose. So you get these organizations having annual meetings, like who uh, is having today, uh, where people can exchange ideas, hear about advance, uh, advancements in other, other parts of the U.S. or the world, and can copy ideas that work in their own area. Uh, what, you know, what's, what's new and what's working? Very, very important, and those organizations still exist today. Um, there was a uh, big decision in the Supreme Court in 1948, that was Shelley versus Kramer. The court said that racial restrictive covenants were not enforceable in court. That made it state action. State action implicated the 14th Amendment, so the covenants couldn't be enforced. So there were two things that happened with that. One, it certainly opened areas that had not been available before, because now people knew that they didn't face this penalty if they sold to someone in another group. In Washington, D.C., an area uh, north of Arkansas Avenue suddenly opened up, and, and many African Americans moved north of that, that dividing line. And this was true in many areas around the country. But there was one problem. The covenants didn't go away. Covenants were still in the deed. So people still acted as if they, they existed and they were enforceable. They weren't, because they weren't enforceable in court. Maybe they were enforceable in the local court of public opinion, in the, the uh, neighborhood improvement association, but you couldn't enforce them in the court. So it was a mixed bag. It certainly was a step forward, but it didn't exactly get you too far. And it didn't get you far with other things. Wenders and developers kept blacks out of suburban housing. Levitan. There were several Levitans. One of the biggest, the biggest, I think, was just north of New York. It was built from 1949 to 1951. William Levitt said, if we sell one house to a Negro family, 90 to 95% of our white customers will not buy. He had no intention of selling to any minority family. And he did not. No sales to blacks. There was a builder from my hometown of Philadelphia named Morris Milgram who had a different idea. Now, he was not a builder on the scale of Bill Levitt, but what he did was build two developments, one in the city of Philadelphia and one in the suburbs. 
in which he said, anybody can buy here. Now, he sort of set a quota, a goal, or a quota, whatever you want to call it, for black occupancy, which he almost immediately had to raise because blacks had so much trouble getting good, affordable housing. But he raised it, and people bought, and the world did not come to an end. Philadelphia City of Brother Love. In 1949, Congress gets into the act again, the Housing Act of 1949. This is going to really build public housing. And the Northern Senators wanted to put in a, an amendment that required that public housing be desegregated. The only problem with that was the Democratic Senators from the South, no way. So here's the deal. You buy that amendment, no public housing at all. So the Northerners were conflicted but they decided they wanted the public housing. And so the amendment didn't pass. Um, the end of OACP was not happy with that. I should mention the end of OACP came into being uh, around 1908 because of a race riot in Springfield, Illinois, uh, which got national publicity. And when it reached people in New York City, they put their Thoughts together, and a year later, the National Association was, was formed. Uh, again, a very important organization to this day in terms of equality. There was a major lawsuit in New York City um, about this time. <coughs> about 19, I think it was brought about 1946. Uh, Stuyvesant Town was a tremendous development, rental development, 8,700 units. It was owned by Metropolitan Life. The president of MetLife said, Negroes and whites do not mix. That sounds familiar. Um, the thing was, the project benefited from street closures, uh, tax abatement. I mean, the city gave a lot, of, a lot of stuff. So you would think that's state action. And if you give state action, you go with the 14th Amendment. It should be, it should be open to everybody. The New York Court of Appeals, which in this case is the highest court in New York, like the Supreme Court, in 1948 said, no, 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 we don't see any state action here. That was by a decision of a four to three vote. Judge Justice Bromley, who was in the majority, had been appointed just months earlier by the governor. And he was up for election at the end of 1948. And guess what happened to just Justice Bromley? The NAACP had something to say about that, and he lost. But the decision stood, and it was some years later uh, until blacks would move into Stuyvesant Town. There were people in Stuyvesant Town who wanted to rent to uh, African Americans, and they had a very interesting time. There's a series of articles in the New York Times about, uh, about that history. Uh, some, of the, some of the other tenants weren't real pleased about that. I mentioned organizations coming together uh, more locally. In 1949, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination, uh, against discrimination in Housing was for state organization. Uh, and then in 1950, the National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing organization, especially the latter, which still exists, exists. And the head of NCDH, National Committee, was Robert Weaver. Uh, he was later the first secretary of HUD in 19, after HUD was created in the, uh, in the 1960s. <coughs> and he also uh, actually had been in, uh, at the Labor Department earlier. He was a special assistant to the assistant uh, <coughs> secretary of Labor, uh, of the Interior Department. <coughs> and uh, he helped to, uh, uh, this was uh, Harold Hickey, who was the Secretary of the Interior. And uh, Weaver, who was, who was, at, who was black, uh, uh, ate lunch one day in the white, high, white area of the dining room. You, you know, you didn't, you didn't do that. And a group of uh, women came to see the Secretary and were very unhappy about it. And the Secretary, um, she said, they asked him, what are you going to do about this? And uh, 
think he said, not a damn thing. And he went to the cafeteria, he jumped up on the table, and he said, this is now open to everybody. Um, this was in the late 1930s. So Weaver, Weaver was around, and, uh, and an important force as the National Committee pushed for trying to get fair housing legislation. Uh, was it, did all this go smoothly? Of course it didn't. In California, the state passed a fair housing law. Colorado was the first state to pass a fair housing law in 1959. A couple of years later, Cal uh, California adopts a fair housing law called uh, the Rumford Fair Housing Act in 1963. And the, the real estate brokers uh, develop a um, constitutional amendment that's going to throw out the Rumford Act. 65% support. Wow. Boy, that, that, that thing has got to go. California Supreme Court said that violates the 14th Amendment. You can't amend the Constitution to do that. So there was a pushback, sometimes not very successful, as a good example. Um, there was a big, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 came along then. Remember, 64 was that, 65 was the Voting Rights Act, and then we get to 68. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 64 was about desegregation in schools, discrimination in the workplace and public facilities. Certainly an important step forward and probably wouldn't have happened uh, if uh, Lyndon Johnson had not gotten the 1957 Act going, uh, which was sort of the first step in this progression. Um, there was a big uh, lawsuit in 1966 uh, called Gautreaux versus the Chicago Housing Authority. Dorothy Gautreaux was a tenant. The housing in Chicago was all, well, the public housing was all on the south side in the black area. And uh, that was a suit against the authority and HUD. And the result was that housing vouchers were made available to people who were going to live in public housing. And the vouchers were available not just in the city of Chicago, but throughout the metropolitan area, which was a, a big step forward. And these the mobility vouchers are still uh, around today and trying to increase the numbers so that, so that you don't get this, this uh, concentration that can be so difficult to work with. Uh, in 1966, there were open housing marches, again in Chicago. Chicago keeps coming up. Uh, that was uh, the march where Martin Luther King got hit by a rock uh, and said the people in the South could learn how to hate. And they had to go to Chicago. Uh, in 1968, a lot of things happened. Um, that was when the report of the National Advisory Committee on Civil Disorders, called the Turner Commission, came in. And I, I want to just one other, speaking of the commission earlier, uh, the
shortly thereafter, two months later, the Supreme Court in Jones versus Mayer said, oh, by the way, that old Civil Rights Act from 1866, that says that housing has to be, it has to be open. Uh, no limitations, not like the legislation said, you know, you only can do single family housing, but that would be. It just, there it was. And what that did, by the way, that meant that you could file a federal lawsuit if you uh, encountered housing discrimination. The enforcement of the Fair Housing Act passed in 1968 was a little, a little skimpy. It took, it took time to amend that later. Um, and then, just sort of as a footnote, in 1982, the Supreme Court sustained testing. That was the technique that the National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing used and other fair housing groups, where they would send match testers out to see whether they were getting the same story. You know, a white couple would go out and go, uh, oh, uh, yes, this is great and whatever. And a black family would come out and go, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's just rented. It. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is. And so you would have that, that disparity. And then you could get a settlement or you could go to court if necessary. Uh, and that way, both the fair housing group and the uh, testers uh, had a right to file suit in court about that. So that, that takes us pretty much up to date. And just as a footnote, when I was attending Antioch, although many years ago, uh, my first co op job outside of Yellow Springs was Cleveland, Ohio. And I was there with uh, Vic Rossi, who's also white and Cleveland Van Lair, who was African, not African American, he was African. He was from uh, the Gold Coast, now called Ghana. So the three of us were looking for a uh, rental unit uh, furnished for two months, November and December 1952, the two coldest months I have ever raised. <laughs> the wind off Lake Erie, let me tell you. Uh, you, don't, you don't want that at that time of year. Um, and so the three of us would go out and, and look for places. We, we looked at ads in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and uh, oh, and then we'd call, and so they'd oh, good, and we'd come out. Oh, I'm sorry, it's just rented. Hmm, wonder why that was. So Vic and I considered whether we should go without Cleveland, you know, and then sign the lease, and then Cleveland would turn up. We're not going to do that. You know, we're upstanding any nice people, so. So they went to the Y, and I, fortunately, my freshman roommate was uh, from Cleveland, and his parents lived in Cleveland, and oh gosh, I had a place to stay for a week. And we kept at it, and kept at it, and finally we found someone in Cleveland Heights who ran to us with a, a little bit of a fish eye. But there wasn't a problem, except occasionally when we ate out, they seated us near the kitchen. But we were very nice. That, those were the days, right? So uh, that was my encounter personally with uh, Housing discrimination and uh, maybe set me on the course uh, that it did, where I ended up uh, in fair housing. The, there's a reading list back there, which I uh, commend to you. Um, the first three, three uh, things on the list, last year was the 50th anniversary of the enactment of the Fair Housing Act, 1918, uh, 1968, 2018, 50 years. And that uh, brought forward a lot of books. And the first three on this list were all published in, in 2017 or 2018. Uh, the first I discovered just really last week, uh, Richard Rothstein, whom I've heard talk, and it's very, uh, the, the whole business, it sort of ties in with that statement about the white society does this and the white society does that. But he it, it, it was sort of left out of that. And, and the white government sort of is, is in, in, the, in, in league with all this. Uh, he put out he put out a 17 minute video, so you don't have to read the whole book. I really recommend the video. The link is there, and I, I watched it. It's a very good summary of his book. And then, if you want to get into it more, you can, you can read the book. But it is a very disciplined, uh, careful analysis of the kinds of things that I've been talking about. The other two books also talk about both the past history and sort of where do we go from here, and they're interesting in their own right. The Warmth of Other Sons is a little different. It traces three uh, black families that took part in the Great Migration. Uh, blacks moved to the north. A lot, of, a lot of this housing history is engaged around the black migration, which started really in the 1890s 
and then there were sort of spurts of, uh, periodically up through the cities. Uh, and those spurts then <coughs> led to problems in the cities and jobs and housing and all that sort of thing. But, but her, her personal uh, analysis, and she interviewed like 1,200 people, she was a reporter, and she really did a, a wonderful job. The last book is American Apartheid, which is sort of the Bible. You can see it was many, many years earlier, but it, it talks about uh, the making of the underclass, again, through segregation. Uh, one thing about uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, there's a story in there that I think sort of sums up the transition, which I, I just uh, really, I think it, it's nice to have something that, that crystallizes things. One of, her fam one of her three families ended up in New York City. And the man got a job as a Pullman porter. So it's a pretty good job in those days. We're talking about this would have been uh, probably somewhere in the 50s when uh, railroads started to desegregate in the north, not in the south. Right? So the deal was if you were taking a train from, let's say, New England to, to Miami, uh, you could sit anywhere up to Washington, D.C. At that point, any African Americans had to go to the colored car, right? So that's that was the deal. Well, there came a time when that wasn't true anymore. But the white porters weren't exactly with the program. So they would tell any blacks, uh, oh, you've got to go to the colored car. Well, our black porter had another idea. So he would, he would see black uh, customers sitting in seats and he would go up to them and say, hey, he's, he's going to tell you you have to move. You don't have to move. You know, it, it, everything's changed now. You can stay where you are. So he said that to one person, one guy who was hard of hearing. And he said, what? You mean I, can, I don't have to go to the black, I don't have to go to the color party? And he says, you're blowing my cover. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that story so sums up how things change. So I enjoy working with you today, and uh, time for questions.
where people tried to get an anti-lynching bill through Congress for years and years, could not, could not do it, could not do it. And uh, uh, so there, there were all these, all these things that were pushing against it. And the NAACP and other organizations you know, did their best to try to encourage breaking out of things uh, as best they could with this governmental sort of hand uh, on their holding them back. But, uh, but it, things, things could have gone much better, and they can go much better today if, if governments, you know, if governments try to facilitate change. And that's it's really important. And just one quick panel at Sundown Towns. Uh, do you believe that that was heavily related in housing in a similar way, which is that they're not there, they can't apply? Is well, well one, one thing, uh, these statistics are, are kind of estimated, part of, part of estimated, but the estimate is that there are a million instances of housing discrimination a year. Okay. Maybe 10,000 complaints are filed. So why is that, why is there a disparity? People don't know their rights, or they think it's too much trouble to try to exercise their rights, I and mean, it's not the easiest thing to come forward, again, sometimes depending where you are, and, you know, in the situation. But, but clearly, there's a lot more discrimination still going on, notwithstanding 50 years of the Fair Housing Law. And uh, educating people about their rights is, is clearly one of the key, key points in trying to get to change that, that disparity. Thank you. I, I was asked to review a book last year, it's called Cycles of Segregation. And it's by sociologists, and their argument is that in addition to discrimination in that history, that the way information is exchanged among people in networks, there's a racial element to it that people within certain racial groups have access to certain information. And in the last chapter, they talk about ways to change that. And they use uh, Oak Park, Illinois as an example where there's an organization that intentionally tries to bring information about for black neighborhoods to white residents about white neighborhood, quote, white neighborhoods to black residents. And I lived in Cleveland in the early 80s, and there was an organization doing something similar to me. And I was wondering if you are aware of other organizations intentionally trying to both get information, but to work against, like what you talked about is this historical momentum towards segregation. And what these authors are saying is that there needs to be an intentional momentum in the other direction. I was wondering if you are aware of organizations doing that. Uh, not, I, not specific. I mean, I know there are such organizations out there. Um, when uh, I lived in uh, Washington, D.C., in uh, this would have been 1959, or the early, early, very early 60s. That was a time when uh, blacks were moving into northwest uh, parts of northwest Washington. And uh, real estate people were blockbusting. I didn't talk much about blockbusting, but that was, uh, that was very popular among some real estate people. Uh, they would uh, go to white areas and they'd say, uh, you know, the blacks are coming and uh, property values are just going to drop and you know, better sell me now. And then they would buy the house at a reduced price and then raise the price and sell it to a minority family. And uh, an, uh, an organization called Neighbors Incorporated sprung up in Washington at that time. Uh, and I was, uh, I was involved with that. I was president of that briefly. And the idea was to educate people that this is, you know, this is sort of a game. And the thing is, we want people who want to have a neighborhood with everybody. This is a wonderful neighborhood. It hasn't changed overnight because people move in. They want to come with a good neighborhood that we've had all these years that they couldn't get into. So that was that was way back. But I, I know I know there are still you know, organizations trying to, to stimulate that kind of discussion and that kind of result. And hopefully if government you know, sort of stays out of the way or, or, or tries to put a positive spin on things, that maybe would help. Did you have a question that will move on? Somebody over there raised their hand. I can talk to them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, 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 be, I'll be here. Okay, well, yeah, thank you very much.
from here. Um, so with that, we are going to move into our executive director, Emily Seidel's presentation on our last 12 months in review. And uh, I'll bring Emily up. And uh, our theme right now for this presentation and for our annual report, which is going to be handed out simultaneously, is called Open Doors. And it's really a celebration of our 20th year as an organization. Some of you can't see the screen and would 
like to, feel free to come over this way or we can move the screen. Um, uh, so it's, the, it's a powerful expression of the purpose of a great home being supplemented by a great community. And it has foundations right here in Yellow Springs, but also in the Southern, Southern Civil Rights Movement. The community land trust is the concept that a community can come together to steward land for the benefit of the community forever. What could be more powerful than that concept? It is extraordinary and an honor and a privilege to be part of this mission. Here uh, you can see our strategic goals. Uh, you can see that over the last few years we committed to broadening our focus um, which is in line of, uh, with the results of the housing needs assessment through the village of Yellow Springs. And I'm happy to report that we met or exceeded all of our strategic goals. So now we're forming a new set of strategic goals uh, for the next five years. Um, and we're going to be looking at the village's housing priorities to do a, some joint planning um, around those efforts. And we welcome everybody's input as we craft our new set of strategic goals. Um, so I'll just give a very brief overview of the activities uh, of 2018 and this presentation, this part of it, is in the order of your annual report, so feel free to thumb through with the presentation and it is in order. So, we will start with some capacity building highlights from 2018 because the theme again is opening doors and um, Certainly, capacity building is part of it. We completed our 30th affordable home sale. Uh, we grew our fixed assets, which is the land that is for the benefit of the community by 71% in just one year uh, through some strategic purchases. The Wright State uh, Clinic site, we also purchased an acre of land, and then we invested in three different affordable housing projects. Um, it was an extraordinary year of growth and of mission impact. Um, I think the land purchases were really phenomenal. Uh, one was five years in the making, the other several years in the making. Um, and so I also just want to give a very special thanks to everyone who contributed to our 20th anniversary capital campaign um, because we met 98% of our goal uh, in so far. So we have 2% to go. Uh, but we were able to achieve our first milestone, which was to purchase this acre of land. Um, so I especially want to thank Malta von Matheson, who led the charge for our capital campaign committee. And so if you could please join me in thanking not only Malta, uh, but also Chris Bongiorno, David Seitz, Susan Stiles, Jackie Anderson, Brittany Parsons Keller, and Gina Gunner.
which is estimated uh, at a total development cost of $10,457,000. The annual tax credit funding awards are very competitive and it's really an all or nothing effort. Um, there is a point system and so I'm happy to give a little update. We did find out that we received a perfect score, which means that we're in the running. <laughs> but it doesn't mean we're going to get it. Um, so after you achieve a perfect score, <laughs> after you achieve a perfect score, uh, the award is then based on several tiebreakers, and there's no way to know how we will fare relative to the other applications. It's a very, very competitive form of funding. Um, but I can very confidently say that our development team put forward the best application possible. Um, and so we will find out if we get funding in this year's funding cycle uh, next Wednesday, May 15th. So, regardless of the outcome, we are committed to seeing this project through and we will continue pursuing it until it gets funded, whether it's this year or the following year or the following year or the following year. So um, thank you and stay tuned and we'll of course make an announcement either way next week, but think positive thoughts. <laughs> um, so a shovel in the ground project this year was Forest Village Homes. And uh, this is our first ever multi-family rental housing. Um, and this project was years in the making and really is a symbol of a whole new focus and a whole new direction for our organization. There is an incredible pent-up demand for rental housing and accessible rental housing, affordable rental housing, housing for seniors, housing for people with special needs, and housing for families in Yellow Springs. Um, and so we are responding to that by broadening our focus, but it took a while to build up the capacity because it's a lot more complicated to do multifamily rental. Um, and we had to layer together a lot of different funding sources, and it's just, it's a whole different animal than the single family home ownership. Um, so the two two bedroom units at 511 Dayton Street are now rented. There was a nice article in the paper uh, a few weeks ago about it. Um, and the four one bedroom units are nearly completed, and we did receive 33 complete applications for those four units. Um, the portal just closed, and we'll be moving forward with the tenant selection in the coming days and weeks. Um, so we plan to adapt this project for future sites, and we want to go have a version of it um, featuring three duplexes as part of the Glen Cottages Pocket neighborhood. And here is what the apartments look like on the inside. I think it's important to show that. <laughs> um, and so I would like to, at this time, first point out that I am aware that there's a typo. I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> um, but also, I want to thank Brittany Parsons Keller. And she hates this, but I'm doing it anyway. So Brittany, if you could stand up for at least just Hold up your arms and do this more. <laughs> but, you know, we, we have a staff of three full-time people and an AmeriCorps VISTA and Miller Fellow student interns, taking all of this on with an incredibly dedicated uh, volunteer board of directors. But Brittany has brought us so much in terms of capacity building, and this is the reason we're able to branch out in this new direction, because of her leadership and her commitment, and she has brought um, enthusiasm and professionalism expertise, and we're very lucky to have her in Yellow Springs serving our community in this way, and we're just getting started. So this is the first of hopefully many to come. So now, I'd like to talk about our financial coaching and stewardship programs, which I think are the less visible part of the work that we do, but very important. The heart of our mission is not the houses that we build, it's the people in the houses, the families who make them home. Um, Chris Hall, who is also here today, Chris, um, <laughs> has expanded the reach and depth of our client program since he joined us, and we are also very lucky to have him on our team. 
Uh, thanks to his leadership and integrity uh, in terms of putting clients first and being an uh, expert in financial coaching, we were able to serve a record number of households last year. The specific number of households that we were able to engage through our pre and post purchase and rental stewardship programs, these are actively engaged clients, is 125. and with such, um, I know I said integrity before, but I'll say it again because I really, that's the word that comes to mind. Um, he, so the variety of ways we engaged with clients before they were in a home were individualized financial coaching, that includes affordability analyses, intake meetings, everything is very uh, individualized to a client's unique financial circumstances, setting goals, uh, connection to HUD-approved homebuyer education, looking at credit and debt and income. Uh, Chris is also a certified loan packager, so he can package low-interest USDA mortgages in-house, which is something we're trying to spread the word about because I don't think enough people know about it. But those interest rates go down to as low as 1%. 1%. Okay. Um, we also facilitated two resales of community land trust homes, which is the really cool economic part of our program. And it means that everything we do is, the idea is that we're setting it up to be successfully affordable forever. Which I have no other kind of affordable housing program in the world can say. And it's catching a lot of momentum nationally and internationally, and it's the right way to do affordable housing. Um, and then he also developed a new rental-focused uh, curriculum that we're rolling out. So, once again, please, Chris, will you just stand up? <laughs> Grants for home repairs. 
and we're expanding that program this year. Um, and so we act as a developer that doesn't go away, which sounds cute, but what it means is that we facilitate resales, we support homeowners with home maintenance and through life's challenges, and trick, we call them trigger events such as job loss, divorce, uh, a death in the family. And there are a lot of things that can make it really hard to stay in your home. Um, and we also directly intervene to help prevent foreclosure when necessary. Uh, we have never had a foreclosure, not a single one since founding, and we hope to continue that trend forever. And we also facilitate resales to the next home buyer of low income when homeowners are ready to move on. So in this way, we're stewards of land, stewards of home, and also stewards of the ongoing affordability uh, by supporting clients before, during, and after purchasing or now also renting a home. I also feel it is my duty to thank all of our funding partners in 2018, and I'm not going to name them all because the list is pretty long this year, but they're on the screen. <laughs> Um, and so if you could just join me in thanking all of our 2018 funding partners for the And so um, we're in, I'm nearing the end, so don't get too restless, but uh, we so appreciate the opportunity to serve the village of Yellow Springs over the last 20 years. Our work and I really and truly mean this, our work has only just begun. And together we have a great opportunity to make Yellow Springs a place where all are welcome and where all belong, in line with Dr. King's vision of the beloved community. Our mission would not be possible uh, without our donors, members, sponsors, housing project partners, volunteers, staff, board, and the clients we serve. So at this time, if you are a staff member, I'd like you to either stand or raise your hand. <laughs> if you're a board member, please stand or raise your hand. Keep your arms up. If you're a donor, member, sponsor, housing project partner, volunteer, or client, please stand or raise your hand. Now, please give yourselves a round of applause. phenomenal history of inclusion, its commitment to social justice, there would be no Yellow Springs Home Inc. It's extraordinarily rare for a community of this size to have a dedicated affordable housing agency. Um, so I will end now how I began, which is everyone here has played a role in making our mission possible and we thank you. This room and this event is what community feels like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin, and thanks for everyone uh, going through that with us. It's part of our responsibility as a board and an organization to report out to our membership every year. Um, and we do have a finance committee, an executive committee, and a board of directors that keep an eye on those numbers uh, month to month. <clears throat> so, through that, we are now going to move on to a more celebratory part of our agenda. Uh, we're going to start, I'm going to bring up uh, Jackie Anderson from our board at Canada, Sanford from our staff, and uh, we're going to toast a couple of board members who've been with us for a long time. I think Jackie's up first.
Mama Elsa, and that ubiquitous three-word phrase, let it go. <laughs> and of course, Barack Obama was president. A lot has changed. <laughs> A lot has changed during the tenure of Jean's service on the board of Homey. In fact, about the only things that haven't changed are fellow longtime board members Cindy Sanford and David Seitz, and the executive director, Emily Seibel. Also unchanging has been Gina's commitment and dependability in her service. In fact, dependable is one of the words that our board president, Chris Buongiorno, uses to characterize Gina's service. He also appreciates another gift that comes to the table with Gina, one that's particularly valuable to me, in my opinion, as well. She brings a calm, peaceful, energy to all of our deliberations. And in so doing, she encourages and she cultivates a measuredness and gravitas in our work. Former, excuse me, former board president Lynn Kramer held up to the light Gina's willingness to take on a role or a task even when it made her uncomfortable. Lynn, who is an organizational management expert, says that that flexibility is one of the traits that makes a board member invaluable, Gina. But the fuller picture of the value added that Homing has enjoyed as a result of Gina's service cannot be better stated than by the words of Executive Director Emily Seibel. Gina was a compassionate, willing board member who put our mission and clients first and was a wonderful community representative. She was willing to step into leadership positions, including fundraising, when we needed it the most. She was a stable, responsible board member and provided valuable insight and support on the executive committee. She did not shy away from difficult decisions. She is a friend to the board and staff alike, and we all look forward to seeing her impact in and around Yellow Springs in years to come. She is a champion of equality, justice, and inclusion in Yellow Springs. Gina, thank you for your service. You've made a difference. We appreciate you.
the honor of presenting this to my grandfather-in-law, uh, who passed away last year after many, many years of dedication and service to the community, uh, to his family, and his friends and loved ones. Um, as far as how he touched me in my relationship to Homie, um, when I moved to town about six years ago, he made it very uh, clear that I should get to know Emily, uh, that I should get to know this organization, and they had a lot to do with my background, uh, and it made a lot of sense. So I was quickly introduced to Emily, we had lunch, and, and from there on I was very involved with the board. Um, but I could see uh, his interaction with Emily and, and her relation to me about how important uh, Wally's contributions were and her coming on uh, to the organization as a young executive director, uh, filling some very big shoes with the able support of uh, the past executive director and with the board of directors, but that Wally was a constant and calming, and that, that term calming, source of support and advice and leadership, uh, very generous with his time, and uh, that all rings true to what I knew about Wally as well. And I'm going to now give Marianne the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. So some of you may not know that the Tony Bent Award was started while I was still the director of Home some time ago in order to have a way to acknowledge people in this community that have furthered uh, permanently affordable housing. And Tony Bent was a founding board director. You may or may not know that Tony and Wally were boyhood friends from Berea, Kentucky, and of course they knew each other for a long, long time. Both very dedicated people to this community and a homage to this community and to affordable housing and other um, causes in this community. I first met Wally in 1970 uh, when I was very young. <laughs> Uh, and from that time on, uh, looked up to him as a mentor. I was also very privileged to be able to, as I grew in my capacity, to continue to work with him and begin to look to him not only as a mentor, but as a friend, and then later as a colleague. That my relationship with Wally, as anyone who knew Wally, was always very special. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, uh, Wally was not a founding board member. I called Will, uh, I called Ilsa Tevitz, who was one of the people who actually started the movement for affordable housing in Yellow Springs after the initial. Green Metropolitan Housing Movement that started in the 60s. So, Ilsa was looking through records. So, while it was not a founding board member, but he came on fairly early in uh, the home history as a board member and was a long time board member. And Ilsa said she remembers him as someone who was always friendly, always having a good idea, and even when we had the rockiest and nastiest times, while they was never nasty. I knew him when I was the director of Home Inc. and when we were when we were struggling with a lot of difficult and sometimes very nasty times. And while he was always my go-to person, and I would go to him when Wally and Evelyn were living in their house on the Center, was Center College? Or College. Wally well, we had an office in the back of their property, and I would go back there with my problems. <laughs> Frequently, I would end up crying. <laughs> Wally well, we always had not only kind words, but was able to sort of calm me down and help me see through to the next steps. So that, that was probably more than anyone else in Homey, the person who helped me through those times. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I am very indebted to Bond, personally and professionally. <laughs> oh. Well, I, I don't know if I can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Jackie referred to me as an organizational management expert. Well, hardly not. Uh, but Wally was. Uh, and you know, two little vignettes about Wally on the board were when I, uh, I'm an engineer by training and came late to the field of organizational development. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, an engineer working with organizations, I like policies and procedures, documents and plans, you know, all those great things. And we needed a procedure to uh, evaluate the executive director. They've never had one before. And Wally developed a really simple, straightforward approach that I think is still in use today that uh, is a developmental method for uh, uh, evaluating the the executive director. In other words, enabling us to encourage them to get better and us to get better board members. Uh, that was Wally's gift to me, along with uh, when, when Mary Ann retired, we were faced with having to find a new executive director. Uh, again, as an engineer, I wanted to get all the, you know, get us to agree on all the qualifications you really needed. And uh, we did that. And it was Wally that looked at them and said, Emily. Oh. <laughs> and that was the best thing I ever did for me. Yeah. 
Wells Springs homing. Steve is in the back here. And so for all of the members present who are in favor of re-electing Steve McQueen to the Board of Trustees, please do so with a show of hands. Any opposed? Any abstaining?
with his son. As uh, so we all know that the house is on the military, especially with disability issues and affordability. So um, I have just was going through all the avenues, talking to people. Uh, somebody told me, hey, call up on this. So I got on with them. Um, uh, our first thing was setting up a meeting with Chris Hall, and that was the first thing that he decided he needed to work on the disability issues because the home make office is upstairs. And he goes, come meet me at the office. We'll have a quick meeting. <laughs> I'm like, I had to call him, I'm sitting at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> so we ended up um, going in the basement of the Methodist Church and just figuring out from there. And we are um, going through the process of getting the mortgage papers and all that other fun stuff together. And realizing that it was going to take a while for all this process to go through. And um, the new apartment popped up. So my friend, unknown to me, put in an application for me. And then I got this call going, okay, you're selected to go to one of these new apartments. I was like, okay, didn't know I was going to one, but that's good. I went and checked it out, and it turned out to be a fully accessible place with a wheeling shower, accessible doors, all the kitchen is all nice and lower down. It was kind of fun when um, both of his, uh, Brittany and Chris, going into the house, and they're all like, oh, is this is down here, this is down here. I'm like, no, this is all where it's supposed to be. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I've just been, you know, just that, how it came about, just, you know, community knows who knows people. So that's a lot of time, but there's a lot of people, especially in the lower income and disability issues, that we don't like asking for help a lot of times. So, but then we don't know what's going on. It takes the voice of other people to, to come in and say, here, here's where you can get help, and here's, go talk to these people. So. Um, but overall, it's been a fun experience. I've actually been in my house um, almost three weeks now. And because uh, for the past two and a half, almost three months, I've been in and out of the hospital. So the first month, that I signed the mortgage on the Friday, on March 1st. On Monday, I was in the hospital. I didn't come out for about a month. <laughs> so dealing was, which was kind of nice for my neighbor, because she was able to move in with her son all that alien stuff with all the boxes. And then a month later, it was my turn. So it took turn to using the recycle bin. And we <laughs> each other out, so. Other than that, everything has been a good voyage, and uh, thanks for having me here. Tree is extremely rare. 
its cousin, the wild service tree, has recently been located in two areas in Britain, Wales and Gloucester. But the true service tree in Britain was thought to have only one surviving uh, specimen, and that was a very old tree in the Weir Forest. But sadly, that tree burned down 150 plus years ago in 1862, and we thought that the true service tree was gone. But then, only in very recent years, a wonderful secret was revealed. That same old, long ago burned true service tree in the forest weir was found to have a direct offspring quietly growing these nearly two centuries in the museum gardens at York. That precious find is the subject of this work, and true service is also the subject of the work of Emily Siles. Like the true service tree, the caliber of Emily's leadership is in fact a rare specimen. Former board president and mentor of Emily, Susan Stiles, if you know her, you know this is true, she does not mince words. I don't think the woman knows the meaning of sugar and coat when you put them together. <laughs> and so, she said, uh, she's sorry she could not be here today, but she gave the following very clear-eyed assessment of Emily when challenged to do so in one sentence. Susan said, I find Emily to be an inspirational leader who exhibits tremendous enthusiasm, authenticity, passion, and vision. Susan is correct to use far-reaching terms as inspirational and vision. Emily is a model of the think global, act local ethic. She champions 360 degrees of homing's mission, project by project, and policy by policy. And at every opportunity and every challenge alike, Emily is thinking about things like social justice, equity, inclusion, sustainability, access, and education. Emily Seibel has become a rising star on the national stage for her commitment to and her success within the Community Land Trust model. The legacy of Emily's first decade at Home Inc. includes so much more than the majority of the projects within our portfolio that are completed with her at the leadership. I mean, there are children whose lives are stable and whose very shelter is assured because of the work that Homing has done under your leadership. There are multi-generational cycles of instability or poverty that have been broken because of the work that donors and members, volunteers, partners, and contractors have carried out under the direction and coordination of Emily Seibel. There are champions of fair housing, affordability, diversity, and sustainability and inclusion because Emily shows up as a mentor. She understands herself to be beholden to the future enough to meet teaching moments when they come. And yet she simultaneously walks through this world like someone who has more to learn than she has to teach. Even on the most granular of decisions for the organization, Emily commits herself 100% to the guidance of Yellow Spring Hall Inc.'s mission. She does so because she keeps first in her mind something she once said, every project I work on will outlast me. And that audacity of per perpetuity is the lighthouse of her work. And we, and our children, and their children, are its beneficiaries. Please take some time as you enjoy your refreshments. Next to the coffee, there are some cards and some very pretty pens that you can write a message of thanks to Emily on and put it in a bag over there by the coffee station. Please take time to do so. And Emily, will you please come and let us thank you for your first decade of true